out this morning. Thanks. Oh. So come right over here. So I have got some hand sanitizer, which has become standard issue in these days, ever since COVID started, hasn't it? And so how do, do we know how we use this? I'm going to open it up. Would you like all two? I'm running, so I'm trying to give it to you. <laughs> Here we go. So we just put it in our hands and then we wipe it, right? Ugh. Really hard. And scrub. And what are we doing? We're getting all the all the bad stuff out of our hands, right? All the germs and the COVID germs, but actually all the germs that might be there. The alcohol in here kills them and makes our hands clean. But what about if I have got bad things inside of me? Can I drink that and make myself clean? No, no. This is definitely a don't try it at home thing, folks. Yeah. <laughs> right, you can't drink that. So, but Jesus is kind of worried about this. In the story we're going to read today from Mark, he is talking with his followers, and he says, I'm, I'm really not so much worried about the bad things that are outside, because we can wash our hands. I'm worried about the bad things that are inside people, like... When people get really envious of other people, when people get jealous of other people, or when people would really like something that somebody else has. Maybe your sister's got this really nice iPod that you might like to borrow, but that wouldn't be cool, would it? So, how do we clean ourselves inside? Well, we've got an answer. Jesus says that when we uh, when we go to God and we can ask God in prayer to clean us. And so in the same way we use the, the sanitizer to clean our hands, we can ask God through prayer to clean us on the inside. So this is a great lesson not only for the young, but the young at heart as well, about when the things that are going on inside of us that maybe are not the way we want them to be, that praying to God is a way to help get it better. And best of luck to you in school this year. And to you, my dear, if we start a new school year. Thank you. We continue our worship by going to God in prayer this day. There is a prayer list in your bulletin, which I hope that you will not only take a time, chance to look at now, but will keep in front of you as this week begins to, to progress. Um, everything that's on the prayer list right now is, is nothing near as new information as things that we would have mentioned at least last week. But what new things do we want to share with each other this day? Prayers of joy, prayers of concern, what might we share? I just want to thank everyone for all the prayers of healing for myself, and I, I really, truly appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> hey, that was practice. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a good no, job. Been... I know. But it was very good. Did a good job. <laughs> I'm asking for prayers for my daughter in law, Kimberly Nato, who has got a cardiologist appointment on Wednesday. Prayers for good results. Um, just prayers for all the soldiers and their families from Afghanistan that lost their lives this past week. Okay, of course, uh, my granddaughter Nicole should go to school, hopefully. We keep our fingers crossed that, that works out. Uh, the young man, Joey, that I've been talking about, finally is out of the hospital. I haven't heard what happened, but I'll get that information. And Harry came in again, made the coffee. I thank him, but uh, he feels he needs to go home, so prayers for Harry.
praying is, Lord, you need to stay awake in worship because you never know what's going to come whizzing by. That's true. I'll try, Jim. Yeah. I would also add um, that we keep the people of Afghanistan in our prayers today. I'm going to say more about that later, but certainly um, a challenging time. The, uh, our intelligence officials fear that there's another bombing that might occur in the next, well, last report I saw was 12 to 36 hours, so certainly there's a great deal of immediate concern, but there's a, a longer story there which is yet to be played out that we certainly need to be in prayer about. And also to be in prayer for the people of Louisiana mm -hmm. as Hurricane Ida um, turns through the Gulf of Mexico heading for what looks to be maybe landfall somewhere around New Orleans once again. If I read correctly, today is the anniversary of Katrina, mm -hmm. so I can only imagine what the people of, of uh, the coast of Louisiana are thinking and feeling as they prepare for that hurricane today. Let us go to God in prayer this morning, first in our silent prayers, mm -hmm. and then together as a community of faith. Let us pray. O oh God of us all, thank you for your word, thank you for your heart, thank you for your call upon each one of us. Please keep on teaching us your ways of love and justice and peace. Plant them within us so that they take root. Let them grow so that they will be seen in what we say and what we do, that we may be steadfast and sure in our love for you. We know, O oh God, that sometimes we get so caught up in our own stuff that we set your ways aside. Please forgive us and help us when we fall short to confess and to know that you still love us and to turn once again to following you. Give us, we pray, discernment of mind, strength of will, generosity of heart, and courage of spirit to live each day as your people. We are so grateful for your grace and mercy, O oh Lord, inviting us again and again and again and again and again to be your children, to live in your love and to walk in your way. And so we offer ourselves to you this day, O oh God, in the name of your Son, who first taught us how to pray. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture lesson today comes from the book of James, one of the books in the New Testament. I'm so excited to invite Janet Lavallee to be our reader this morning. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so yes, uh, book of James, chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be kind of fist fruits, fist fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accepted the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. 
But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and the religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and window, widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Our second lesson today is from the Gospel of Mark, beginning chapter with verse 1 in chapter 7. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they did not eat unless they washed, and they observed many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, said to Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? And Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, Those people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother should be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise receive from me is korban, that is, a gift devoted to God, then no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like this. Again, Jesus said to the crowd and to, <clears throat> and to them, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what it comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he said? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from outside can really make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his stomach, or into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all food clean. He went on to say, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, and folly. All these evils come inside and make a man unclean. My friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <clears throat> The story is told of a man who came down out of the North Carolina mountains one day to the only town for miles around. He was all dressed up in his Sunday best and he was carrying his Bible under his arm. A friend saw him on the street and said, Elias, what's happening? Where are you going all dressed up like that? And Elias said, well, I've been hearing about New Orleans. To tell me there's a lot of free running liquor there and pretty women in that town, I've decided I'm going to go down there and see it for myself. Well, his friend paused and kind of looked Elias over. Then he said, but Elias, why are you carrying your Bible on your arm? And Elias replied, 
well, if New Orleans is as sinful as I hear it is, I might just stay over until Sunday. <laughs> Since the beginning of recorded time, stories about evil, about forbidden and unexplainable things have aroused the attention of us humans. So we really shouldn't be surprised that the Pharisees and the chief scribes of the temple in Jerusalem would be any different. They have been hearing these stories of what's happening on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Unbelievable stories about a man who could feed more than 5,000 people with just a tiny bit of food. Of a man who would heal people by the mere touch of his garment. Some claim they even saw him walking on water across the lake itself. Having decided to go to Galilee to see all this for themselves, a group of Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law in the great temple come to the seaside town of Genesaret near Capernaum to learn more about this man. Now can't you just imagine the look of disbelief and anger in their eyes as the Pharisees accosted Jesus on this day? They're ready to attack the tiniest error, and so they immediately begin to complain about some of the disciples who have not ritually washed their hands before eating. How could Jesus allow them to break the law in this way? Now we need to understand and remember one important aspect of this unfolding story. Only some of Jesus' disciples had failed to adhere to the ritualistic tradition. Not all of them. This was not some unintended protest designed to undermine revered sacred customs. It wasn't something that the group was doing in response to the Pharisees being there. Instead, it would appear that some of Jesus' disciples were more orthodox in their Jewish practices, while other disciples were less strict in their observance of the ritual of washing hands. For the citizens of first century Palestine, the question of clean and unclean were fundamental religious principles. Focusing on the issue of purity, the Israelites had developed a system for distinguishing between the sacred and the profane. And this system was based on a clear understanding that God was purity. So when Jesus questions the Pharisees' preoccupation with purity laws, he's basically questioning their understanding of God. And so what we have here is one of the basic conflicts that runs throughout Mark's story of Jesus Christ. In a nation controlled by a complex system of religious and dietetic laws, Jesus consistently says that obeying these old traditional laws is not enough. In verse 8 of our lesson, Jesus says to his critics, you abandon the command of God and hold to human tradition. Jesus knows that the Pharisees and the scribes are really not concerned with hygiene here, but with maintaining the ancient ritual traditions. So, this statement becomes a major condemnation. Kind of like walking through the front door of the Methodist building down Methuen and accusing Bishop Devadar of rejecting the commands of God in order to uphold the rituals and the traditions of the United Methodist Church. Human nature being what it is, I suspect that Bishop Devadar would have gotten a little threatened if something had happened like that as well. So Jesus then goes on to proclaim to the people listening that it's not the thing taken into the body from outside, like food or water or the very air that we breathe, that destroys a person's soul. Instead, it's the threats that lie inside us, that lie inside of our heart. Things like avarice and greed, anger, lust, murder. All these things come from the human heart and must be cleansed away if we are to enjoy a saving relationship with God. In fact, this insight is the heart 
of Jesus' message to the Pharisees. Repeatedly, Jesus warns the Jewish leaders to avoid observing the law in a manner that distracted from the main purpose God had intended for the law to serve in the first place. Take the case of hand washing. Leviticus chapter 22, verses 1 to 16, lays out this, to, this ritual of hand washing when it insists that the priest who ate the food dedicated to God at the temple must themselves be pure and clean. And so, over time, that statement in Leviticus was expanded to the point where the law demanded that temple priests had to wash their hands six times before they could eat the food that had been dedicated to God. Well, the Pharisees, those that created the law, took this one step further and the reason that if the priest had to be clean in order to eat holy food, that the average day person should do a ritualistic cleaning of their hands as well before they ate their food. Now ask yourself, how often do we confront the same kind of logic within the church? For example, it was hammered into me as a boy that proper clothes were necessary to worship God on Sunday morning. Every Saturday night, we would take time to polish shoes, boy or girls, and I always wore a coat and tie to church, no blue jeans, and definitely no white socks. I mean, where was Elvis to help me on this? <laughs> Never mind that my tie was uncomfortable, that my shoes were hand-me-downs from my older cousin. Looking nice, I understood, was the way that we honored God. Later in life, I attended a church in downtown Durham, North Carolina. It was the downtown church, the first church in that town of about 10 Methodist churches. And the people dressed to the nines when they went to church there on Sunday morning. That tradition, that ritual, probably started with the widow of Benjamin Duke, the man who founded Duke University, or gave the money that created Duke University. Mrs. Duke lived across the street in her mansion, and she would come to church every Sunday, whether it was 10 degrees or 100 degrees outside, with her mink stole wrapped around her neck. She would always come in about 10 minutes late so that she would pray down the middle of the aisle, go and sit in one of the front pews, kind of reserved for her family, to make sure that everyone saw how elegantly she was attired. Or another case in point, I'm talking about our own John Wesley. He was ordained an Anglican priest in 1728 after graduating from Oxford University. Yet only 11 years later, in 1739, this same John Wesley had been banned from every pulpit in every church in the Anglican Church, the Church of England in Great Britain. Now, what was the cause of this punishment? What created this dramatic split between Wesley and the church. It was all about John Wesley's decision to stop using the ritualistic prayers of the Church of England, the written prayers the priests were required to read from the Book of Common Prayer, and instead to write his own prayers, speaking to God from his heart on the issues of the day. From this blatant break with the established rituals of the Church of England, John Wesley was forced out of that church and into the streets of rural England. And that's where the Methodist Church was born. Having an authentic relationship with God is not a matter of simply following the rituals of the church. Anyone who thinks that Christianity consists of attending worship on Sunday morning, going to Bible studies, making financial gifts and committing or participating in committee meetings from time to time really misses the point. Reduced to its very essence, Christianity is a relationship between you and God. That relationship includes God's offer of forgiveness for past sins, God's promise that grace will help you grow towards Christian maturity, and then our decision to accept these gifts from God and make them our own.
the Pharisees in our lesson today are too worried about getting all the external behaviors correct, about observing the time-honored rituals. They're concerned about the little things, about the things that happen outside one's body, like whether a person has washed their hands or not before eating a meal. In contrast, in our lesson today from Mark, Jesus emphasizes what happens inside one's body, the virtues of faith and a holy and pure heart. The words of Jesus here are both liberating and irritating at the same time. He refuses to allow us the comfort of a carefully prescribed and regulated religion. Instead, he demands we focus on what is really important, the status of our relationship with God. So I think there's three conclusions that we can draw from today's story. First, we need to pay close attention to the state of our relationship with God through Jesus. If you have not made a commitment to Christ, if you're unsure about your salvation, if you're lukewarm in your faith, then today might be a wonderful time to make that relationship one that will last for eternity. Second, we need to use the outward forms of religion only as a way to spiritual maturity. We should never assume that our outward worship that we offer to God is all that's required of God in order to be touched. On any given Sunday, I may mess up and I may offer to you the pastoral prayer when the doxology should be sung. And Jesus tells us today that those slips really don't matter in the long run. Our rituals merely serve as pathways to help us reach a loving relationship with God, the relationship that we deeply desire. And last of all, wherever the outward forms of tradition and, and ritual obstruct the importance of the inward gospel, then I think we have an obligation to either change or get rid of those rituals. There's something in our worship practices that stands in the way of helping people build their relationship with God, and we need to implement change that will help people live in spiritual obedience. Back in 1786, John Wesley wrote a sermon entitled, Thoughts on Methodism, where he says, I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist, either in Europe or America. But I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power of religion. The possibility of being spiritually dead, of going through the ritual of religion without the relationship with God, is a real threat to us all. So let us pray this day that we're delivered from that danger we have our faith in God. Amen. 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 As we prepare to offer our gift to God today, I want to bring to your attention um, a letter from Bishop Devadar. There's copies of this over on our welcome table. I'm not sure if you all saw and picked up a copy. If you didn't, I would encourage you to get one as you leave, or maybe we can pass them around as we're taking the offering. But this is Bishop Devadar's letter about the events in Afghanistan. And I want to share it with you to hear his words about this, but also because he shares information in here about a couple of ways that those of us who might feel moved to do so could provide some humanitarian assistance to the people of Afghanistan. So there are ways to make gifts directly to support the people in Afghanistan itself. There's also a fund that has been established in partnership with Church World Service to help with refugee resettlement here in America. I know that the mayor of Portland, Maine, for example, has already gone on record saying that Maine is prepared, that's Portland, but the state of Maine in general, is prepared to welcome Afghani refugees and um, bring them into their city. 
At the same time, I want to lift up, and, and um, so you're that aware, of an organization called JFON, which stands for Justice for Our Neighbors. This is a national organization that has a chapter here in the New England Annual Conference, it's an organization that's supported by the gifts that we make each Sunday, that provides legal assistance for free to individuals who have come to America seeking asylum. There's a chapter in Portland, Maine. Portland is, in fact, a, uh, a surprisingly active entry port for people seeking asylum in the United States. There are also three chapters in Massachusetts, uh, one down in the Lawrence area, uh, one closer to Boston, and one out in Springfield. Lawyers either donate their time or, uh, at low cost, assist individuals seeking uh, asylum here in the United States to work their way through the laborious red tape process that goes with being recognized as um, an asylum seeker and eventually re um, receiving legal status here in the U.S. And our gifts support that ministry on an ongoing basis. With these words in your heart and with the words of, of God ringing in your ears this day, let us return to God a portion of all that he has blessed us with. act of giving, like every perfect gift, comes from above. We are called to be doers of the word, not just hearers, and having heard God's call to care for others, we must respond. Let us not be hearers who forget, but doers who act, and so we will be blessed in our doing. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn today is, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. The verses are in your bulletin. Let's join our voices together as we sing.
with God in the days to come. Wash your hands? Well, it's a great COVID-19 practice, but it may not be the best answer to the question that's in front of us. By serving others, yeah, that might be a better answer. And so there's certainly ways to do that. There are volunteer opportunities here at North Salem. Our clipboards are at the welcome table, and we certainly invite you to take a moment to sign up to perhaps be a scripture reader, to help with the clothing bin, to provide snacks for our coffee hour after church, or to help clean the church itself. There are other ways that you might serve. You might serve yourself by participating in our small group Bible study, which continues this Thursday evening at 7 o'clock by Zoom. Mark gave us, I thought, a really fascinating uh, lesson last week about the four gospel stories and the focus that each one has. We're going to shift away from the Bible for at least a week, and this week we're going to talk about the history of the Methodist Church in America. How did we come to be here, and why did we prove so successful? In 1880, there were more United Methodists in America than any other denomination. That was our high point. And while we certainly have not maintained that number one ranking, if you will, we're still one of the largest denominations in the country. What was it about Methodism that allowed us to grow so quickly as this country began to expand to the West? We hope you'll come and join us for that study. We might give to others. Next Sunday is our first Sunday in the month, September the 5th, and we as part of our new tradition here at North Salem, are invited to bring food items for the food pantry down at Pleasant Street United Methodist Church. We're going to focus on snacks for children this month, so you're invited to think about individual packs of cookies or crackers, um, fruit or, or puddings, things that would provide uh, snack items for young people, either for school lunches or for time after school, etc. Also, I want to invite all of you to be with us on Sunday, September the 12th. That's probably going to be our last Sunday outside um, for this summer season. Um, and on that Sunday, the 12th, we're going to have a blessing of the backpacks service. So Adrian, you need to get your backpack ready to come. I've got mine ready to go, and if you've got a backpack, I want you to bring yours as well. We're going to send a special invitation to all the families that have children in our church to come join us outside um, for a special blessing. And also, um, I think a special treat, uh, Kelly Petrovich, who has been with us before, is going to be our guest preacher on next Sunday. Lynn and I are going to be taking some vacation time. We'll be leaving after church next Sunday. And we're heading down to um, uh, Amish country, down to the Lancaster County in Pennsylvania for a week of, of uh, getting away. Uh, I've jokingly said that we're going to that part of the country where there is more than one mentor in the phone book. <laughs> so uh, I will be with you on Sunday the 12th, but Kelly will be preaching that day. And I'm, I'm grateful for her willingness to come and be with us. So my friends, as you go forth this day, I invite you to do, oh, I knew there was something else I wanted to say, and it just didn't come to me. Sometimes we also serve by serving others in the community. And I was really excited to get this week in the mail an announcement that the Greater Salem Chamber of Commerce has announced its recipient for the 2021 William A. Brown Distinguished Business Person Award. And it's our own Bill Ermer. Oh, 
Bill is going to be recognized at the annual Chamber Business Meeting on September the 22nd. And I know several of us are going to be there to cheer him on that time, that time as well. So, my friends, as God has loved you, go now and love others. As Jesus has forgiven you and redeemed you, go now and extend God's grace to all you need. And as the Holy Spirit has transformed you into the likeness of the Son, go now, letting the life of Christ guide you every moment of the day. So, my friends, go in love, go with grace, and go in the light of Jesus. Amen. 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 So today I'm going to be singing home from the Broadway musical Beauty and the Beast. And this is right after she decides to go with the Beast in place of her father. Sir. 